Concepts of Biology, Chapter 19, Population and Community Ecology. The first two sections of this chapter are about population ecology. We talk a little bit about the human population, and then there's a last kind of extended section on community ecology. We study ecology for multiple reasons. A lot of the times when we're looking at studies of populations, of or all of the members of a certain species in a given area. A lot of it has to do with food production, safe food production, or as we'll see, it has to do with tracking human life expectancies, which has a really big impact. Populations are always changing. They can be changing in response to seasonal or yearly, just regular uh, alterations in the environment, natural disasters, or competitions for resources between and within species. When we study population ecology, a lot of what we look at are demographics and, dem um, and demography. The study of these demographics is just kind of the statistical mapping of certain populations. We use a set of mathematical tools to describe populations and then watch how and why they change. A lot of those tools were actually designed to study human populations and it was statisticians um, specifically called actuaries that work for life insurance companies who came up with a lot of these calculations. One of the most famous calculations, <coughs> excuse me, are the um, calculating of a life table. A life table lets you know how long any individual within a given population is expected to survive. And the reason that they were initially calculated was to allow life insurance companies to dish out rates with kind of a, a profit to benefit ratio in mind. This is a mapping between population and body size in Australian mammals seems like a bit of a jump than what we were just discussing, but it's one of those examples of uh, mathematical calculation that actually tells you a whole lot about a population. Because as you can see, the more dense a region is, so the more densely populated a given population is, the smaller those individuals of that species are likely to be. And that harkens back to two of the characteristics we commonly use to describe a population. That's population size, the total number of individuals in a genetic region, and population density, the total number of individuals per unit area. Now we study size for kind of obvious reasons, but we also know that genetic variation is greater in larger populations and that the impact of evolution tends to be greater in smaller populations. Population density is kind of uh, something we study because we look at how many resources there are and how many potential mates they are. So everything we kind of define in this chapter has a very applicable kind of logic behind it. When we estimate population size, there are a few different things we can do. We can do a total count. If you have uh, a smaller area and individuals that don't move around a lot, it's pretty easy to catch or catalog everybody, but they're not generally realistic. More commonly, we use quadrant counts. That's when we randomly count all the individuals in certain quadrants of an exact size. So I'm going to count all of the four-leaf clovers in a three-by-three three area, and I'm going to count 100 three by three areas. And if my total study area is, you know, 1,000 feet, then I can multiply each quadrant by the total number of quadrants and have a pretty good guess at how many individuals exist in my total area, even if I didn't count my total area. Another more commonly used example are for individuals that are regularly moving around. So maybe we're trying to find, you know, mice or snakes or bugs in an example, and we can use the mark and recapture method. In this, we catch a sample and we mark everyone we caught. We let everybody go and then eventually we come back and we catch a second sample and we know how many in that second sample were ones that we caught before. And we know which ones, obviously, because we marked them the first time. And then we can use a simple mathematical equation and predict the population size. And that mathematical, mathematical equation is the number you caught the first time divided by the number you caught the second time. And then you divide that number by the number of marked individuals from the first catch that showed up in the second. And it will give you an accurate 
estimate of the total population size. I realize it might sound a little random, but we're not going to go into the statistics behind uh, why that is a good way to calculate it, because this isn't a stats class. Just know that there are ways to mark and recapture and appropriately estimate a population size. Another thing we commonly look at when we talk about population size is we would like to study how they are dispersed in their communities. It can be random, like weeds through a field. Certain populations are clumped, and that can affect the health or kind of lifestyle of that population. Think animals that move as a herd. And other populations are uniformly dispersed, where everyone has the kind of exact same range where they can uh, build a nest or find food or do whatever it is that they need to do. All three of those situations kind of let us know some general characteristics of that animal and how it lives. What we find when we put a lot of this information to work, we can come up with survivorship curves. Survivorship curves show us the distribution of individuals in a population according to age. So how many individuals do you have in your population at birth? How many individuals are there you know, 10 years later? And how many individuals are there 100 years later? What we find when it comes to survivorship curves is that there are three major types Humans, most mammals for that matter, are type 1 survivorship curves, or a lot of larger mammals we should say, are type 1 survivorship. And that's because death primarily occurs in the older years. You have a very low incidence of death in humans at a young age, and then once you reach a certain age, bodies are overcome by regular wearing down um, and disease, and you have a larger dying off. The type 2 survivorship curve is something you see in birds where death at any age is equally as likely. There isn't an age with a bird becomes too infirm to survive. They're just as likely to die at any point in their lifespan. And then survivorship curve type 3 is um, when you have a low chance of surviving your younger years, but once you hit a certain age, you're very likely to survive to very old age. And we see that in things like trees where they release you know, thousands of eggs but only uh, a few of them will become mature trees eventually. Growth models are another commonly used or common uh, kind of theme in population biology and we see two different growth models. The growth model on the left is the exponential growth model and that's when resources are absolutely unlimited and we're just looking at how fast could a population grow if they had absolutely everything they needed all the time. Clearly it's not very realistic. There's no real situation on earth where we see that. So what we end up with are, is this, this J-shaped curve. You have all these individuals and they're growing at this ridiculous rate and you see their growth and population size just skyrocketing eventually. More realistically, we end up with the logistic growth model and it has kind of a, an added feature to it. What we see in the logistic growth model is more of this S-shaped curve. Because a new population in a rich environment might find that they're growing rather quickly, but eventually they're going to reach their carrying capacity. And the carrying capacity is simply the number of individuals that can realistically be supported by an environment. There's only so much food, there's only so much space for nests, there's only so many rocks for breeding, you know, there's only so many fish to go around. So these populations that might be booming, thanks to a change in environment or maybe even new protections for their species, will find that their population numbers are going to grow rather quickly until they hit their natural carrying capacity and you end up with that S-shaped curve. So in population ecology, usually we find the logistic growth model in most of our populations we'll study, but kind of in an idealized environment, we can um, showcase that exponential growth. Here are a few examples of that. Yeast grown in ideal conditions will have kind of that classical S-shaped logistical growth model because eventually even in ideal conditions, you know, maybe in a flask in our laboratory, they are going to bump up against the walls of the glass. So they still have some sort of carrying capacity that limits them. A natural example might be seals. Um, showing a real world fluctuation. We had some major protections of seals once we realized that they were going extinct and their population boomed. Eventually they hit their natural carrying capacity and the population has since kind of leveled out. And we find that a lot of populations either live at or below their carrying capacity. One of the interesting things when it comes to studying populations and how they exist in an environment is sometimes we find that they are kind of curbed 
by density dependent factors and sometimes populations can be curbed by density independent factors. So when we talk about density dependent factors, that's your typical resources. How many monkeys can I realistically feed in this forest? How many nests can we realistically make? How much water can we realistically supply to keep everybody alive? That's a density dependent population. Density independent restrictions on populations come from, you know, something like a forest fire. It doesn't matter how many, you know, gorillas live in a particular forest if it's wiped out by a fire. The number of gorillas that survive doesn't have anything to do with how many neighbors they had. It probably had everything to do with the luck of the draw or where they were when the forest started. So we find that examining the different factors that affect a population can also teach us about its potential health. And we, we reach kind of an end goal. There's an end game to all of this that we'll get to at the very be at the at the end of the lecture. So to wrap up the sections on population-based ecology, what we find is there are whole kind of suites of characteristics that evolve as populations evolve. So we find that as your body changes in response to your environment, you know, birth rates change. How young or how old you have your first child changes. The number of children you have changes. And even death rates. They change as the organisms evolve also. What we have found is when it comes to these types of factors, we can, generally speaking, group organisms into two large groups. And those groups are called those who are case-selected and those who are called R-selected. Case-selected species do very well in stable, predictable environments. They choose, um, they exist, exist really close to their carrying capacity. Case-selected species have large but fewer offspring, and they contribute a lot of resources to each offspring. So every offspring has a much higher chance of surviving than those found in the R-selected species groups. An example of case-selected species would be, you know, elephants, gorillas, or humans. R-selected species do better in unstable and unpredictable environments. They have large amounts of small offspring. They don't provide a lot of resources or paternal care, and the offspring are relatively self-sufficient at birth. You don't have to put a lot of effort into having these babies, and that's great because you might have a few hundred of them at a time. Examples of our selected species are jellyfish and plants. Life history strategies do not need to evolve as groups. You don't have to get every characteristic kind of en masse. You can evolve each characteristic a la carte, independently from one another. So some species find that they kind of dip into both the K-selected and R-selected species characteristics, but you can, you know, kind of draw a few lines and make some generalities about different species at some points. Now that we've looked at population ecology, let's take a couple minutes to talk about the human population, which is growing at an exponential rate. As you can see here in this J curve, there have been only a few times in human history where a population has dipped. One of those examples is the bubonic plague in the time of, uh, in like medieval times. And another example is around 18, 1918, 1919, when the Spanish flu wiped out as much as one fourth of the human population. Other than that, we've been growing exponentially. In fact, we're growing at a rate that's starting to kind of freak some people out because we seem to be reaching the next billion marker in uh, fewer and fewer years as we progress as a population. And we found that there are a lot of restrictions, obviously, on how much fresh water we have, on how much food we can grow, and how many medicines we can create. One of the biggest issues is how certain populations are growing. We find that some populations are growing rapidly, some of them slowly, others at a stable stage, and some we're a little curious about. In the areas of rapid growth, issues can come from not having enough schools, homes, or jobs for the children at the bottom of the pyramid when they reach the age they need those things. For slow and stable growth populations, there aren't as many issues, but sometimes we're concerned about maybe tax dollars coming in in order to pay for services for older and younger, um, old, the oldest adults and then the youngest individuals. In that fourth stage, what we're seeing is that fewer and fewer individuals at the reproductive stages are choosing to have kids. So we might end up with more older adults and not very many people to take care of them in the sense of physical care and also not enough people earning money to be taxed 
to pay for those individuals who can no longer work. So there are a lot of economic concerns. We also find that certain populations have very different percentage of growth rates. In more developed countries, growth rates tend to be much lower. It's far more expensive to have kids, and a lot of people choose not to have them because they have that savings, which allows them to do other things, but it's all really about personal preference. So it can be a really touchy area to kind of um, to discuss and to study. What we find in some third world countries and developing nations is that people are used to having families with 10 or 11 children because only two or three of the kids probably survived. With modern day medical interventions, however, you have 10 kids and nine, nine of them are probably going to survive. So they have much, much, much higher growth rates than the surrounding nations. Let's take a look at community ecology because very rarely, even as with our examples of human beings when it comes to um, water resources and food resources, do we find that populations exist on their own? There's always a lot of interplay with other populations around them. And the predator-prey dynamics of the hare, lynx, and the plants that the hare eats is a really interesting example. So a hare is a bunny rabbit and they eat plants and lynx are feline type of predators that like eating bunnies. So what we find in populations with hare and lynxes is that one, let's, we're going to start at one year just to keep it simple, but in one given year, there are not a lot of lynxes around and there's really beautiful weather. So there are a ton of plants. The bunnies don't have a lot of predators and they have plenty of food, so they do very well. Not many of them are eaten, they're very healthy, they have large litters of bunnies, and the next year there's an explosion in the bunny population. That means that there are a lot more bunnies eating the plants around them and that the hares are doing particularly well. There's a lot of bunnies, they're very healthy, and they have large litters of lynxes. So that next year, there are a ton of predators for the bunnies, and the bunnies don't have very much food because there are too many of them fighting for the same plants. So what you end up with is a collapse in the bunny population because of starvation and overpredation, and therefore the next year you have a collapse in the lynx population because there's not enough bunnies to feed them all. But the plants are doing great because there isn't anybody around to eat them. However, in that fourth and fifth year, you have not a lot of lynxes, a whole lot of plants and not a lot of bunnies and the whole process starts all over again. These predator-prey dynamics are studied in the boom and bust cycle and we end up seeing a lot of them in the environments. Few populations, if any populations ever really, exist on their own. A lot of evolution in plants and animals deals with adaptations to the others who are living around them. We find that plants are evolving to have physical defenses like thorns or chemical defenses like plants, uh, or excuse me, like toxins being produced by plants to keep other organisms from eating them. Having these chemical and physical defenses will drive animal populations to evolve so they can eat other things or get workarounds for eating these particular plants. We find that evolution is driven in animals in order for them to avoid their own prey. Or excuse me, their own predators. Here you can see a tropical walking stick that's evolving to look more and more like the plants on which it lives so it can be eaten. Or chameleons who can change their body shape and color in order to be protected by their own, in order to be detected by their own predators. We find that some animals are evolving these really incredible colorations and warnings that serve to other predators that they shouldn't be eaten. So instead of trying to hide, they're trying to make themselves brighter and brighter and therefore potentially scarier and scarier to anyone who might want to have them for lunch. Other animals are taking the easy route. Instead of developing these crazy characteristics that make them themselves dangerous, they actually just look like someone else who's dangerous. And we refer to this process as mimicry. You're harmless, but you look like someone who's dangerous. There are examples where maybe you are mimicking someone else who doesn't get eaten that often, not because they're dangerous, but because they taste terrible. Some species of butterflies are very, very bitter and therefore make a very, very bad lunch. There isn't anything dangerous about them, they're just disgusting to eat. So other butterflies are actually evolving to look like them so they themselves aren't eaten as often. Hopefully their predators will think that they're gross too.
we study the competitive exclusion principle in community ecology, and it can kind of show us who's going to do best in an environment and lead us usually to discussions about genetics and why one species outcompetes another. In this situation, you see two species, both of which do great in the exact same growth medium, like an auger plate with nutrients. However, when you put them in the same medium, instead of each of them growing at about half what they used to because they're sharing resources, we find that one of them is being outcompeted, potentially to the source, or potentially to the extent of becoming extinct, which is a whole new field of study within itself. Not all situations are like that. When we have two organisms living in the exact same environment, it's called symbiosis, and there are three potential outcomes for symbiosis. The first is commensalism. In commensalism, one individual benefits while the other individual doesn't care or at least isn't harmed by the situation. A great example would be birds building nests in trees. The birds get the benefits of being up high and having protection of the tree from the elements. The tree doesn't care. Symbiosis example number one, commensalism. Symbiosis example number two is mutualism. In mutualism, both of the individuals in a given environment are going to have positive outcomes from the relationship that exists. Here we have termites that form a positive relationship with the symbiotic protozoa that live in their guts. The termites feed the protozoa, and the protozoa in turn release some of the nutrients and the termites food that they wouldn't have had access to before. So symbiosis outcome number two, everybody benefits. Outcome number three is a lot less pleasant and that's parasitism, parasitism, excuse me. In a parasitic infection, one of the organisms does great. They're the parasite. They're enjoying eating you for lunch. And in the other individual, there's some sort of illness due to the parasite stealing their food, worming its way through their body, or maybe even potentially damaging something important like a red blood cell. And that's symbiosis outcome number three. We've been alluding to communities and how they work together, so now let's take a look at some of the factors we should consider. That's biodiversity, foundation species, and keystone species. And once we kind of understand how communities are built or what's important to them, let's consider their dynamics. Most importantly, we ask ourselves, what happens after a major disturbance to a community? And how can we tell that that community is healthy and is going to return to its normal functioning um, biodiverse community? When we talk about biodiversity, we're looking at species richness, and that's just how many different species live in a given space. The more species you have in one area, the more um, rich that particular area is. Places near the equator seem to have the greatest species diversity, and that's because they have pretty consistent weather all year round, and that consistent weather means that um, there doesn't have to be as, a, as much adaptation to change. And because of that, you get a lot of different niches in those environments where organisms can go and flourish and do great, and there's not, not, there's not a lot of fluctuation to their environment, so they have a lot of time to essentially do whatever they please. When we study certain environments, we find that they have foundational species. When an environment has a foundational species, that means it can actually be quite fragile. Because if you lose your foundation, everything else collapses. Coral reefs are excellent examples of biodiverse regions that rely on a foundation species. The coral reef is where everyone either lives or eats, or lives in, or lives on, or eats in, or eats on. So when you lose the health of the coral, the entire environment collapses, and we're seeing massive collapses in the environment off the side of, uh, off the coast of Australia, and we're even seeing it now in places like Brazil. Keystone species are a little bit different. A keystone species helps to keep all of the other species in a given environment in check. Excellent example of this would be the starfish that live in the ocean and warm coastal waters. Starfish are really great predators and they eat a lot of mussels, but they themselves don't reproduce all that often. So what we end up seeing is that the starfish are going to eat a lot of your mussels, which eat constantly, and keep the mussels 
from essentially over harvesting a given area. So if you kill off the starfish, you have far too many mussels and then all of the plants die and then everyone else who eats the plants dies and it just turns into this huge kind of domino effect. So the starfish themselves aren't important to the life cycles of everyone around them, but they do affect the life cycles of everyone around them. We study these keystone species and these foundational species because after a major natural disaster, we would like that ecosystem to become healthy again. And we wanna know what needs to be introduced and what to look for that tells us that the environment is on a path to getting better. What we find is that after a major disaster, we first look for primary succession plants and animals, and then secondary succession plants and animals. Primary plants and animals that come in after something like a volcano erupting are things like succulents or lichens. They do just fine living on bedrock or brand new lava flows, and they can break down that rock and add nutrients from themselves as they pass through their life cycles to build up at least a semi-nutrient soil base. As some bugs come to pollinate them or live there and those bugs die and go through their own organic cycles, they add even more material to the environment. Once the primary succession plants and animals die, you end up with secondary succession plants and animals and you're going to get more growth, grasses, weeds, smaller perennial plants. As they add to the organic matrix of the new soil, you can then support larger plants and animals, shrubs, pines, oaks, and eventually you reach the climax community that's more greatly, uh, more biodiverse, has more species richness, and shows a lot more health. And that's when you end up with some mature oaks, large forests, you know, rainforest, things that support really large mammals. And we know that that environment is on its way to being healthy once again. With that, we end chapter 19. What you should do is read the chapters, take notes in your own words, consider all of the graphs and charts in this chapter. And there's a lot of information kind of enveloped in them. And if you can get that graph in your mind, you can probably answer a lot more questions about this information than you think. So once you're done with that, take a crack at your homework.